Welcome to A Walk in the Garden. I'm Liz Davey and this program is filmed by NCTV in my garden in the town of Norfolk. And you would not guess by my attire today, no hat, no gloves, no jacket, that it is mid to late November. Our strange weather continues. We have had a frost and it's gotten quite cold. So I have been able to really work on garden cleanups, but Today and tomorrow we have a break and we're having some 60 degree weather, which is delightful. Speaking of the climate, the USDA today announced that they have put up a new map. Now they have different numbers and we have now moved to 6B. We were formerly 6A and when I moved here, we were 5B. So things are getting a little warmer according to the USDA, Department of Agriculture that is. And of course there are microclimates and if you've driven around town for too many years, you notice where they are. I know there's a, a little microclimate on the way to Millis on Route 115. The trees always leaf out earlier there and they always color up earlier too. So it is a little, mi or later, it's a little microclimate all its own. And you may have one in your own yard where you know that the area is a little colder in the winter or a little warmer in the summer. So you can take the ratings with kind of a grain of salt, although they're a good guide. When you're buying plants, those are the little numbers that you see on the plant labels. And you know that if the plant is six or less, it should grow well in your garden. If it's labeled 10, it will be a plant that you need to either take in in the winter or decide that you don't need it anymore and let it go when it frosts. I'm standing in the herb garden today and as you can see it's covered with oak leaves and though they look a little messy they will stay here for the winter because they provide really good mulch for my herbs that are underneath. Oak leaves are good in that they do not mat down like maple leaves do so if you leave them on your flower beds they provide a nice mulch and the nutrients from them will go into the soil so I tend to leave them and then I'll be cleaning them up come spring and I think we have a rabbit that just rolled through <laughs> behind me. Maybe he doesn't like what I'm saying. Anyway, uh, these plants will just stay here. Many of them have seed pods on them that uh, birds and other little creatures can enjoy throughout the winter. And we can still use the sage, which is evergreen, and also the thymes, which are under here. And these two are evergreen and I can come out any time that there isn't snow and pick a little time to take in the house for fresh time. I also can probably still, because of our weather, pick some of the chives that are in the back, although they will be gone soon if we do have another cold snap. I've taken out all the plant labels. I know where the plants are now. I keep a little list and I've taken out other decorative items, my sundial, and other decorative things that were in the gardens and stored them away for the winter. I've cleaned the birdhouses. The one that used to be here has been taken down and stored. Uh, helps keep the mice out of it. And uh, others that are attached more firmly have just been cleaned for the winter. If possible, you can leave them open if it has a door. And that too discourages other things from nesting that you don't want to nest in your birdhouse. But they'll be ready for spring if they clean, are cleaned now. Now let's move over to the perennial garden. I leave a lot of the native perennials in the perennial garden. Uh, the annuals have been pulled out. We had some zinnias right here and they have been added to the compost pile. The uh, snake root and asters are still quite attractive uh, with their seed pods on them and again uh, available for the birds and other little creatures that might enjoy a little taste. The native plants also provide a home over the winter for insects and butterflies. Not all butterflies fly to Mexico. Some of them stay as their pupa in the soil and the stems of the plants here in this country and will come out in the spring. So you want to leave some space for them. Again, I have oak leaves on the garden as mulch 
and I have some straw over this plant. This one tends to be a little tenderer. It's uh, the Flomus, and actually I may no longer need to mulch it if, if we truly are getting that much warmer. I've had this plant a long time and it uh, used to suffer with the cold. Also the plants can suffer if you don't get enough snow here and last year was a hard year for many plants because we didn't get snow and we had a very very short but intense cold spell which uh, was not very good for some of the plants. So I have put some straw on the flomus and that will come off in the early spring when it starts to leaf out again. <sighs> Moving down I've left the asters but I have taken some other things out. This little area in here had a little problem in, with weeds and some uh, artemisia that had spread a little too much. So I did clean up that area. It was a good time to clean it up and I planted some spring bulbs in there, some hyacinths and some crocuses and we'll see if they come up in the spring. I also was digging in there anyway because I removed the canna and the begonia that were in that area to bring the bulbs in for spring. I have a rose right here and the way I winterize my roses is to use compost on them and I will be basically pouring a bucket of compost right around the base of each rose and that will stay all winter and help protect the roots of the rose especially if we don't get any snow cover to further protect it. My milkweed is still doing its thing and I've saved quite a few of them and I can come out anytime with my paper bag and save even more seeds. I'll put the fuzz in the bag too and then shake the bag good and the seeds will mostly fall to the bottom. Some of them will need to be pulled out. I save the fuzz and I put it into a little bag and hang it up in the spring and the birds can put it in the bottom of their nest and have a soft spot for their babies. Moving over this way I have a, a Cedum Autumn Joy. Now this is not a native plant but I leave it anyway because it is somewhat decorative especially if it gets a little snow on it. I also pick this and you can paint it if you wish but it adds to uh, winter arrangements with greens and uh, I like to spray it a dark red but uh, you can also spray it gold or silver or whatever fits with your color scheme. So I'll be picking some of them and I'll leave some in the garden for just some winter interest here. Moving down and we've got enough wind to keep my hair and my eyes today. I also will be picking red twig dogwood. Now this is uh, a plant that profits by being cut back every year or every year or two because the newer stems are the ones that are bright red and these two are good to add to winter arrangements especially the branching stems and I will cut this one all the way down here's one that's branching to the base and use these stems in my flower pots and even in indoor arrangements and take off the leaves and so we have a good start on holiday decorating. More on that a little later. I'll also be picking things like seed pods. These two add to arrangements and can be spray painted and this is a uh, allium and it the blooms have kind of dried nicely this year. They don't always. Sometimes if there's a lot of rain at certain times they just get droopy. But this time they've looked pretty good. Several of the other plants are a little tender. I've been able to keep over my uh, chrysanthemums. This is a chrysanthemum that's gone by. This one's been here probably oh six or seven years. And there is a lot of new growth down at the base of it. If you bought chrysanthemums this year in a pot and tried to plant them, they may or may not come back. We've had a warm fall, so they may have had time to form roots. 
But the best way to ensure that your chrysanthemums come back is to plant them in the spring when they're tiny little plants that you usually have to mail order because the nurseries don't carry them until fall. Nobody wants to buy that little plant when they could get something more showy. But for this one, what I'll do is just fold it down and then put a basket full of oak leaves over it. Again, oak leaves are a wonderful mulch because they don't mat down like maple leaves do. They stay crisp and the air spaces between them provide insulation for the plants. I'm going to do the same thing with my lavender. And again, you know, maybe in years forward I won't have to do this. But just to be safe, I will continue, at least until my baskets fall apart. And then I put a rock on each one. And they look a little wonky for the winter, but they do protect the plant. And again, at, in early spring, I'll take those off and the plants should be fine. You'll notice I have new growth of the uh, uh, Shasta daisies and an oriental poppy. And that's normal. They put on their growth and some growth in the fall. They'll be just fine, even though it's been warm and you think, oh no, they're starting to grow again. They really aren't. That's a, a normal phenomenon for them. Now let's head over to the vegetable garden and see what we've been doing over there. The scarecrow has moved to the garden shed for the winter. Uh, she'll live there and, until spring. I actually undress the scarecrow and bring her attire inside because my shed is not mouse proof and I have lost several costumes over the years. So she, her attire comes inside, her frame stays in the shed. The, gar the vegetable garden is pretty much ready for winter at this point. I have mulched a little early. Ideally, you would put the straw on after the ground has frozen, but our ground is not freezing. And if we're like last year, it may not freeze until February. So I decided just to go ahead and mulch. I still have some crops that we can pick and use in this garden. Uh, this is the row we planted last month of garlic. And I had a little more garlic than one row, so I have a, a little bit near my parsley. I have parsley over here, two kinds, curled and flat leaf, and I have quite a bit of it. And I'm gonna cover that with straw, and parsley being a biennial will return next year. I planted it from seed this year, makes leaves the first year. Next year it will come up and go to seed. So you could keep your parsley going pretty much forever. I have some from uh, two years ago, that one I'm going to let go this year because I need the space for other things. But I'll keep this nice little row of parsley. And I can come out here whenever there's not snow and pick parsley to take in the house. Again, we talked about saving parsley last week, and we'll do that again. This is kale, and we like kale. And kale will last until it's very, very cold. In fact, it gets better after a frost. It becomes a lot sweeter. So I've been out picking and using kale, and I'll pick some of that for the freezer and blanch it and freeze it in uh, freezer bags for soups and other things that I might want to make. This, you can't really make a salad with the frozen kale, but it certainly is good and nutritious in a soup. I also have a little lettuce left and plenty of arugula in several spots. I've been using the arugula in salads, we like that, and there is some lettuce I planted late coming up. Covered my strawberries with straw. You'll see there's some strawberries that aren't covered with straw along the edges. I can only have a row so wide, otherwise I'm not able to pick them. I can't reach in from both sides, I'm short. So I have to have some control over where the strawberries are. I mean, I've got strawberries that have come over this far. I'll, if they're there in the spring, which they probably will be, I will dig them out and share them with people. Uh, but the ones that I want to keep, I did put under the straw cover. Raspberries will just stay as they are. Uh, nothing needs to be done with those until spring. Although if we get some nice days like this, I can go in and start pruning them. Pruning the uh, raspberry stems that 
produced fruit this year. Those will not produce fruit again, so they can be cut back and leave, the new, leave space for the new stems. But again, that can be done either in the fall or in the spring. I've started my burn pile. They will go in the burn pile and be burned when the burning season starts in the end of January in Norfolk through May 1st, when you do need to get a permit in order to do any outside burning under certain conditions. Again, more arugula, and I've been picking that regularly. It will go eventually, but we'll use it until it does. So the garden isn't completely finished yet. Now let's head out and look at some of the other things I've been doing. I'm taking advantage of these nice days to uh, start doing a little holiday or winter decorating. I prefer to say winter because I leave it all winter. My window boxes, plants, went with the frost as would be expected. When the temperature got down, the annuals faded. Some of them weren't quite gone, but they were close enough that I pulled them out. And what I do in my window boxes and in my planters, you'll see more of those in December if you watch the show, uh, I add greens. I can always do a little pruning on my evergreens, so I add the pruning to it and then some seed pods that I've collected. The Autumn Joy is here. I've got some uh, Sweet Annie that was in the garden, the pods from the Alium, a few pine cones that I picked up. We have pine trees that shed pine cones, and uh, some other seed pods that I just found when I went for a walk. This, this one is uh, I'm not sure, ironweed, the ironweed, and it's losing its fluff, and underneath the fluff are, are little teeny blossoms that are dried, which I think will be kind of cute in here. And these will stay all winter, red twig dogwood too, and I can add things to it. I'll be adding some holly from my holly bush, and possibly some Christmas balls, maybe a ribbon. You can add to it other things. Lights can be added in the larger pots. So I leave these up for the winter. They look a little better than empty pots, and I don't move my fiberglass and plastic pots into the in in the winter I, or empty them in the winter. I leave them out, and but any terracotta or ceramic pot does need to be moved in. We're getting warmer, but we're not that warm yet. The ground and soil in those pots will freeze and the pot will break. So terracotta and ceramic need to be moved in where they are out of the weather before freezing. Now let's head back to the pond. I've pulled out all the hosta from my shade garden. I have a lot of hosta and it tends to collect slugs if you leave that old dead foliage in. So I remove the foliage from the hostas. It also doesn't look very pretty as it starts to go. So all of that foliage has been removed to the compost, but there are a few things that stay green out here, and I enjoy being able to see some green over the winter. It really brightens my mood. I have quite a few hellebores. They t seem to have uh, spread around pretty well, and I kind of transplant them to where I want them. And also Christmas fern. Christmas fern is so named because on the fronds, the individual little leaves look like a Christmas stocking. That's one good way to identify it too. And it stays evergreen all winter, which is a nice feature. This is a plant called Lacofue, and uh, it too stays green all winter. Has some, uh, it's got some buds on it for spring. It'll have little white bells on it. And it likes the shade, as you can see. It will need to be cut back in the spring, uh, but uh, stays green all winter, as do the rhododendrons back here and the evergreen things. So I can look out and see some green and it gives a good place for the birds to kind of roost when the snow starts to fly. Coming back towards the pond, once all the leaves fell off the trees back here, I was able to take the net off the pond and, well, I cleaned them up first and then took the net off the pond. So now I'm just using the uh, net to pick up any extra leaves that happen to be around. The fish stay in the pond all winter. 
I have not plugged in the heater yet. This uh, leaves a hole in the ice so that the gases that the fish waste produce can get out of the pond. If the pond is sealed tightly, which with the rocks around it, I don't think it really seals tightly at all. But uh, just in case, I use the heater that keeps a hole in the ice that the gases can escape. I don't feed the fish once the temperature grows low. However, I have a feeling today they'd like some. This is a cool water food that I use in the fall and early spring. Uh, but with the temperature in the 60s today, I'm still throwing in a little at times and they're coming up to get it. But generally when the temperature falls in the, below the 50s, especially the water temperature, they will not come up to eat. And they go into kind of suspended animation, just kind of slowly floating around under the water. And you can see them through the ice moving around. It's interesting to watch. My shed has a plexiglass wall on the south side. It stays warm. This is my little work, working area and I will be working on my Christmas decorations out here getting things up and uh, in fact we'll be changing the door very soon so that we have moved from fall into winter. We'll be reversing the Dutch door decoration at least. This plant is northern sea oats and it too is a good one to pick to add to fall arrangements or winter arrangements. It has a very interesting little seed pod and I really will pick them all because I don't want it spreading. It will spread and if you don't want a lot more of it, if you do want a lot more just leave it and it will spread. That's another reason to leave the seed pods on your plants if you want them to spread. But generally I will take it off and bring it inside and use it in arrangements. Take the leaves off and they can stay outside. I did clean up much of this area with the leaves simply because uh, of slugs and other things that tend to, voles are another one, that tend to get under the ground covers and create a little mischief. And so I wanted to make sure it was cleaned up a bit so I can see if there's a problem before it gets too pronounced. Now let's head on inside and see what's cooking in the kitchen. We could call this program end of fall because what I'm doing is using some of the fall things left in the garden before winter arrives and also it is around Thanksgiving and some of these things could be made using leftovers from your Thanksgiving feast. I'm going to make today a chicken pot pie and I am going to start by making the filling. I've already made the crust. I've put it in the, my pie pan and I've made the top crust and just have it ready to go onto the pie once we get it filled. I've got my oven turned on and heated up to 400 degrees and I'm melting a little butter in my pan, about three tablespoons. And I'm going to add three tablespoons of flour. I'm making the gravy, as it were. If you have leftover gravy, that's what you'd use. But I don't have any leftover gravy, so I have to make something to hold everything together. And I added three tablespoons of flour, some salt and pepper, and I'm going to just stir that around until the flour is completely mixed in. You want to get that flour cooked, and then I'll add two cups of chicken broth. gradually so that we can stir in the flour. The idea is to let this cook about a minute to make sure that that flour is cooked. The, some of the chicken broth was from cooking the chicken so it's congealed and it is cold. It was in the refrigerator so it'll take a little bit of time to thicken and this will thicken into a nice little gravy. And then we can add the other ingredients. I like to put the filling into the crust hot. You could make the filling in advance 
for instance, right after your Thanksgiving dinner, you could put your filling together with leftover gravy and vegetables and turkey. But you want to add it warm, so I'd heat it up. You might want to use the microwave even. But put it into the crust hot so it goes into the oven hot. It will take less time to cook and it tends to brown a little better, I think. Now we'll add the rest of the ingredients and I'm going to add some onion. I could have uh, browned this up with the butter before we added the flour but it is going to go in the oven and be cooked and I did use a sweet onion rather than a yellow onion so I think it will be just fine and get plenty of cooking. Sometimes I do it one way and sometimes another. Then the main ingredient is the chopped cooked chicken or turkey. And we're added, added plenty of that. We want a chicken pot pie that is true to its name. And then we need some vegetables. I'm going to add about a cup of frozen peas. Oops. And I've cooked about a cup of carrots and these are were dug from the garden last week. They're nice and sweet because they did go through a frost. And I cooked those in the microwave. Anything you don't have, you can always cook in the microwave if you want to add green beans, lima beans, whatever you'd like to add. You could also add a can of mushrooms. That's especially good if you don't have quite enough chicken to fill it in a little bit. So now we're ready to add some seasoning and I'm going to, I did add some salt and pepper at the beginning. I'm going to add about a half a teaspoon of dried thyme from the herb garden and stir that in and other seasonings can be added if you prefer. For turkey you might want to add a little sage. Again salt and pepper definitely. Now it's time to put it in the pie pan. put on our top crust. And I'm going to use my rolling pin to help me get it over there and lay it across the filling. And now I will crimp the edges. Pinch it together. Let's move this out of the way so it can see. This pan has a wider lip on it, which helps with this, and I'll take off any extra crust around the edges. If you're using a large pan and purchased pie crust, you may need to roll it a little more to make it large enough to fit on your pan. And that's best determined before you start, rather than when you're halfway through. You roll it around. And then I'll go through and crimp it along the edge. Just pinch it. And then I'm going to use some heavy cream on the top of the pie. This will brown up nicely. A 
I'll just brush that on. also act as glue for the little turkey that I'm going to put on. I use one of my cookie cutters. I have a collection of cookie cutters. Most of them are antiques now, I guess, because they came from my relatives from long ago. But I'll put the little turkey on. You could use autumn leaves or anything you want or nothing at all. And then I'm going to brush that one with cream too. I've cut some uh, little feathers in it with a knife, made a little eye on it. And again, you can do that now. I started cutting them, but I'll cut some more. Just some feathers and uh, just a little eye. And then I want to poke some holes around the edge for the steam to escape as the pie bakes. And we're going to move some of this stuff and put the pie in the oven for about 35 minutes. And this is a 400 degree oven. And set the timer, which is an important thing to do. And then we're gonna make some more of our meal. Uh, I've made a little hors d'oeuvre and I started this earlier. I made little pumpkins on uh, Ritz crackers and what it is is cream cheese, half a package of cream cheese for this amount, which is a small amount. You might want to use the whole one and double it. And then I used uh, red pesto. The recipe called for red pesto. I didn't have any red pesto, but I did have some roasted red peppers. So I uh, combine those with one of the pesto cubes that we made on a prior show. Uh, I make my pesto in ice cube trays so I can defrost one cube at a time. So I mixed about a whole pepper and one pesto cube and added that, a tablespoon of it, to the cream cheese along with a little uh, seasoning and made little balls out of it after it had chilled a little bit. And then I'm going to finish them up by using a pretzel to, I've done it on some of them, but what I'm going to do is make little grooves in the side just by pulling up the pretzel. Actually these have warmed up a little so they're harder to do. It's best when they're right out of the refrigerator, but just to make little grooves that make them look more like pumpkins. And then the stem is just a piece of pretzel stuck in. And we need a leaf on our little pumpkin and we'll use some of the flat leaf parsley. Flat leaf parsley has little bunches with three leaves in each one. So each bunch. So we'll just take one little leaf out of each. I think I took too many on that one. Yeah, we want just a tiny piece. one of these little leaflets. And this will make our hors d'oeuvre. I'll put these over here. And just a little, little snack, which is still a fall flavor. Now, I had raised some pumpkins. I planted them light, but I did get a couple pumpkins. This is one of them this way up, I guess. And I'm going to preserve those to be used in my cooking. And how I'm going to do that, or have done that with, some, with the other one, I hollowed out the whole inside. And I kept the seeds, because I'm going to roast those for snacks. And hollowed it out completely. Then I'm going to put it on parchment paper. 
and poke holes in it again to allow the steam to escape. And we're going to put that in that same 400 degree oven. And they will uh, shrink a bit and they're much easier to peel after they've been roasted. And we'll just roast the pumpkins for about 45 minutes. And I'm going to set the timer for that on the lower oven. Because I forget. <laughs> now the seeds that I saved are here and I have already soaked them overnight in salt water. About a tablespoon of uh, kosher salt to two cups of water and soaked them overnight. Then I drained them out and I dried them on a dish towel, clean dish towel. So they're ready to be roasted and I want to add a tablespoon, or not a tablespoon, I'm sorry, a teaspoon, just a teaspoon of either melted butter, melted coconut oil, or olive oil. I'm using olive oil. And I'll mix that in. And then I want to add a sprinkle of kosher salt. It's up to you how much you want to use. Just a sprinkle is enough. Mix that around and then I'm going to put those on a foil line pan. And we need to spread those out, which is probably the hardest part of this whole operation. Not very hard at all. Okay. These are going to go in a 325 oven for 30 to 45 minutes. So our timing's pretty good. I've got the lower oven set at 325. And we'll put these in and we'll come out with our, our pumpkin seeds. And I have another snack to go with our little pumpkins. And I happen to have some already done. And they come out when they're nice and, and brown and very crisp and light. So there's our, our little pumpkin seeds. Now, the next thing I want to do is a salad. And this is a good holiday type salad. And I'm starting with a, a bowl of arugula. And that's been washed and uh, broken up into pieces. And I need to make a dressing for that. And what I'm going to use is a, a quarter cup of olive oil. You could use a sunflower oil or other light oil in it, whatever you choose. And we're going to add two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. tablespoons of apple juice. I have to remember how much I'm putting in, so I, I do have to check it from time to time. Half a tablespoon of lemon juice. I keep a little jar of lemon juice in my refrigerator. Every time I need a little lemon juice, I squeeze the whole lemon and just keep it in the jar, and then I have it when I need it. It works out pretty well that way. And... We want to add a little salt and pepper to that. And just a little bit of salt. We tend to go easy on the salt these days. And some honey. This will kind of bind it all together. And I want to add about a tablespoon and a half of honey. You 
If you're using honey in a recipe and it also has oil in it, if you uh, put the oil on the spoon first, the honey will come off the spoon a lot better. I'm going to stir that a little, but then we're going to shake it. The glass jar. So there we have a dressing that we can add to the salad. And we need to add some goodies to it. And what I'm going to add is an apple that I've cut up. Any type of apple will work. The recipe wanted you to use Honeycrisp. I don't think this is Honeycrisp. I think it's Gala. But whatever apples you like. So what I've done is I've cut it slices and I put a little bit of that lemon juice in the plastic bag because I did it in advance. So if you're having a dinner, you want to get your salad ingredients ready, as I have, make sure you put a little lemon with it and try to exclude as much air as possible and that will keep the apple from turning brown. I'm also going to add a half a cup of dried cranberries. Actually, I could probably add a little more arugula too before I serve it. A cup of toasted pecans. I toasted these at 350 and on a cookie sheet and then let them cool. And about six ounces of blue cheese. So we can mix that around and uh, add some of the dressing. I'm going to wait to add the dressing until we have the salad. We'll just have it nearby. In fact, I could put it into a, a nice little pitcher if that was something I wanted to do. And I'll put that over this way for now because I'm going to make dessert. And the dessert I'm making is uh, pumpkin mousse. And it's a very easy recipe to make. And I'm using the pumpkin from one of my own pumpkins. I have four ounces of cream cheese and I'm going to add to that seven and a half ounces of pumpkin puree. Now this can come out of a can if you don't happen to have your own pumpkin. But if you've done your own pumpkin, and uh, what I've done with the pumpkin once it comes out of the oven, I run it through the food processor until it's nice and smooth, as you can see. It uh, is very smooth. It's not quite the color of the one in the can, which I've been told is really a squash, not a pumpkin. This is really pumpkin. Then I'll add a half a cup of brown sugar. And I'm going to mix that together with my mixer. So it's nice and smooth.
I'm going to add some pumpkin pie spice and you can add a combination of cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, ginger, whatever you like in your pumpkin pie or a pumpkin pie spice which comes in a jar. And then I'll mix that in well. And keep mixing until it's smooth. This is a lighter dessert than pie. And we already have pie on the menu, so. Okay. There's some beaters. And no, I've already pre-whipped some heavy cream with uh, two tablespoons of sugar and a half teaspoon of vanilla. And I'm going to fold that into the about three quarters of it. I will fold in and I'll mix a little in first and then fold the rest in. This kind of uh, starts it, gets it going by mixing in a little at first and a little heavier. It lightens up whatever you're mixing in. Then I'll add some more. It's light, but it is rich. I made it last Thanksgiving and everyone really enjoyed it. It will hold for quite a while in the refrigerator as well, so you can make it in advance. You want to fold until all of the cream has been added. And I'm going to add, add it to some little dessert dishes. Hopefully a little neater. And garnish it with a little of the whipped cream. It's more than I intended, but always good. Just a bit. And then I'm going to, you can garnish it with a whole pecan, one of the toasted pecans would be good. But I'm going to use a, uh, just a candy corn on each one. In my house, candy corn was not a Thanksgiving candy. It was a, or not a Halloween candy, it was a Thanksgiving candy. We never had it for Halloween, but we always had candy corn on Thanksgiving. So I'm going to continue that family tradition by adding a candy corn as a garnish to my little dessert. Our pie is out of the oven, it's time for dinner. And I'm adding another item, and these are cranberry pecan oatmeal scones. Recipes on King Arthur flour. They're really easy to make and they're delicious. Not only for dinner, but for breakfast. So it's there, if you look it up online, you'll find the recipe and they're fun to make and don't take very long at all. So we've got our appetizer, our pumpkin seeds, our dessert, uh, pumpkin mousse made with pumpkin that we grew in the garden, chicken pot pie, and salad with the garden. So this is the end of fall. We're ready at the end of this month to go 
into the holiday season and start doing some holiday decorating and wait for winter to come. I'm Liz Davey and you've been watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Cable Television.